for the rhythm. For the rhythm. I've always been involved in musical things. When I was younger, I played the trombone. Any bones in the house? Nobody, nobody. We got one, that's right. You guys stick together. I was kind of forced to play the trombone. I really like it because I wanted to play the trumpet, but I had braces. And that's a big deal. It's like, yeah, that hurts. That hurts really bad. In fact, it wasn't just a trumpet, it was a cornet, which is a little bit smaller. And I had braces, and I was like, wait. Uh, and it hurt. So I went to the trombone. And it, the funny thing about switching from the trumpet to the trombone is all of a sudden, you're not the most popular person in the song anymore. And usually, trumpet gets a lot of the melody, the trombone gets a lot of the harmony. And, and, and so I, I would have to be really good at the timing and the rhythm of when I was supposed to come in, right? Because there's a lot of times where you're just like waiting there. And there's these things I was learning. I was learning how to read music as I was growing up through high school, right? In, Connors, or in middle school and uh, before that. And Connors was really good at helping me learn how to play music and that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I remember learning, especially when I started playing trombone instead of trumpet, was... There was these things, as I'm reading music, they're not notes, they're, they're not keys, they're not the lines, they're these little squiggles right in the middle. And it's like a different language, right? Music is a different language. And, and in this language called music, these little squiggle things were called rests. You guys, you guys familiar with what I'm talking about if you play music at all? They're called rests. And, and it blew my mind as I'm learning about rests. Because it was like the music was saying intentionally to me, yeah, just don't do anything right now. <laughs> just stop. You're not important. Somebody else is more important than you right now. Uh, just, just rest. Uh, it didn't even leave a space there. It's, it didn't say just like, all right, there's no more music for you to play. It was like, no, don't, don't play. Stop it. Like, cease your music. And I love that. I love that. But if you think about other areas of your life. How many other areas of your life do what my music did for me? That tell you to stop, that tell you to, hey, don't do anything, just rest. How many other areas of your life give you an intentional rhythm of rest? That's what I want to talk about tonight. Because in general, we're not encouraged to take a whole lot of breaks, are we? In general, you're not encouraged to just rest. In fact, the opposite is true. You're, you're pretty much told in every area of your life almost, do more, go, 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 be in constant motion 24-7, right? So, so technology, I think, has helped uh, that, develop that, change that, however you want to say that. Technology has influenced that to the point that when, when for example, you would leave school, Okay, socially you had a rest, because now you're at home, and you didn't see anybody that you knew before. Or, or uh, if you left the game, you know, you're playing a game, or you're hanging out with friends, and you didn't go home, no longer are you with them. And technology has changed that, so that you never, if you want to rest, you don't get a rest, and if you, if you don't want to rest, well then, you can certainly lean in as much as you can, because people are always available. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not going to be like the old person, like, oh, this is so terrible. But I think we can all admit, at least, technology has influenced our ability to rest from people. Whether it's school, maybe. You're trying to graduate. You're trying to work hard to get uh, a certain grade. You're trying to keep up with your homework. You're trying, whatever it is, it's not like you're getting less and less. It's not like any teacher out there is going, you know what? That other teacher, his homework is probably more important than mine. So if you don't get around to it, if you just take a break from mine, you can rest. No, I mean, every teacher thinks that their class is more important than any other class, which is good. They, that's why they're teaching it. Wouldn't want somebody teaching your class that didn't think their class was that important. Um, and, and you're told in school, man, this is so important. It's going to influence the rest of your life. You don't get into the college you want to get into that's going to set you up for the career that you, that you have to decide when you're a sophomore or something. That if you don't get into this and if you don't get the right grades and you don't get the right program and you don't get into the right scholarship, 
then, then, then your career is like beyond hopeless. And, and so there's a constant pressure to do more in school. Whether it's your activities, right? School, fo football started out as fun. Soccer started out as fun. Basketball, volleyball, all the sports. Band. Podosky people, you know. Um, band. All this started out as fun, this thing you do you have with your friends, the thing you would do to compete, and then all of a sudden, people began to take it so much more seriously, and then you had practices like twice a day, you had practices on Saturday and Sunday, you started having games on days that you're supposed to have off, and you're like, man, the more that I get into sports, the more that it just demands everything from me, and so sports begins to demand everything from you, and then, and then there's church, there's youth group, and it feels like just another thing to kind of add to the long list of checklists to, to live up to certain expectations. You gotta do this, you gotta come here, you gotta, right? And, and so you've committed to so many other things and God just kind of seems like at times just another thing that I've committed to. It's just like, oh, when I can squeeze it in behind homework, if it doesn't work out, like if I can't get my homework done on Sunday night, I just won't go to church or youth group or whatever. If, if, if there's something inconvenient that comes up and I gotta, I gotta go to this tournament, I, I guess I can't show up at church. And so it's kind of like this thing that gets, gets slotted in there. And so all of a sudden, we begin to view life like, holy moly, we are always on. There's always an expectation. And, and, and of course it makes us feel stressed out. Of course we feel like we're overwhelmed. Um, if you didn't walk in feeling stressed out, I'm sorry that I just did that to you. <laughs> um, the truth is that you have a lot of things going on, and at times it feels like you're on a treadmill, you're constantly moving, but it doesn't feel like you're going anywhere. And the truth is we weren't meant to be on a treadmill like this. We weren't made to be constantly in motion. Can I always say that to you specifically? You were not made to be constantly in motion. We've been talking a lot about the last few weeks about how we want to be in a rhythm with God, a relationship that is constantly going back to certain habits that we just put on rhythm and we're in a rhythm with God. But today I think we're, what we're going to look at is one of the most underrated, different, probably radical ways that you can interact with God that I promise you will make some people look at you and go, What? I think it'll maybe be one of the more life-changing habits that you can develop in your relationship with God. We're going to look at the connection between loving God and, and resting. Between loving God and resting. The idea of not resting, the idea of this constant motion is not actually this new idea. For thousands of years, people have been defining themselves, themselves by their production, how much they can produce, how much they can do, their, their consumption, how many things they can accumulate, right? how much stuff that they can get. Your production and your consumption for thousands of years throughout human history has been something that we tend to define ourselves by. And it was, say, true in the same way in the biblical times. Um, and the Bible addresses this very issue. Chances are you've actually heard this passage talked about before. Chances are you've actually probably read this passage many times, not only in the Bible, but on government buildings and on little handouts from your Sunday school teacher and on like plaques in somebody's bathroom wall. Uh, it's, it's the Ten Commandments, right? And, and so it's not this new idea but, but let me set the scene for you for a moment here, because what had just happened leading up to Exodus chapter 20, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. What had just happened leading up to Exodus chapter 20 was God's chosen people, the people who were set aside to be different and to, to proclaim the glory of God and to be the community of people in which God found his residence, they had just been delivered from 400 years of slavery. 400 years of their entire worth being defined by how much they produced for somebody else. 
To give you context, the United States is just over 250 years old. That 400 years is a long time. Like, nobody here thinks of themselves as, oh yeah, we just came over from across the pond. Just recently, just a few hundred years ago. Right, you're like, no, I'm American. <laughs> through and through. Stars and stripes forever, y'all. Right? Like, can you imagine 400 years of identity-shaping slavery? They had just been delivered from that. Their entire identity was shaped by, for 400 years, their ability to produce. Now they get into the desert and they're wandering around and God says, I have something so important for you to learn. I have a new way of living for you to be defined by the covenant that I am going to keep with you. So God, God gets his chosen man, Moses. Moses walks up onto the mountain and all of a sudden smoke fills the entire mountain and it starts thundering. <laughs> Lightning is shooting out in the sound of many waters and trumpets, it says. Like, God is rolling in. The mountain's shaking, lightning just shooting out everywhere, and Moses is stuck up in it, right? And everyone's like, ah! And Moses comes out of that after, I think it was 40 days, not eating at all, right? Like, he's just face to face with God. And, and he is so filled up with the glory of God. Like, God met with Moses face to face, it says, as a man meets with his friend. And Moses' face was beaming so much that he was blinding people. They had to put a veil over his face. Like, man, Moses, walk around with a bed sheet over your head for a moment. Because I'm going blind just looking at your face because he had been in the presence of God. God met with him, came out of heaven face to face with Moses. I'm a, I'm a, and then beyond that, He's like, I'm going to give you something in my own handwriting. He's, he inscribes into stone. God just writes with his finger in stone and says, this is how you're going to live. This is how you will be defined by the glory of God of heaven. And he gives it to Moses and Moses walks down from the mountain just right? And everyone's like, oh. I mean, can you imagine the importance of what Moses is holding in his hands? You have on there the Ten Commandments, things like, you shall have no other gods before me. Right? You shall not covet, you shall not murder, don't commit adultery. And you know what else is on that tablet? Number four is Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Fourth thing that God says, he says this. And you shall remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you will labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, your servants, your animals, the, the alien re residing within your gates, you know, the, the foreigner. Why? Because in six days is referencing Genesis chapter 1. God could have let's put your imagination caps on for a moment, right? God could have and everything was created. Why do you, six days seems like a short amount of time to create everything until you realize you're talking about God and you're like, why did he take so long? It's <laughs> just right? Like what took God so long to create everything? He could have done it like this, right? So there's, a, there's a verse in, in, in Genesis 1 that says, oh, and he created the stars also. Just like an afterthought, like <laughs> billions of stars. Just like, oh yeah, and he did that too. Like what took God so long? Why did he take six days? Because God was setting a precedent for you, for me. You know what he did? He took a nap on day seven. Speaking figuratively. Naps are a heaven ordained thing. God took a nap before He ever created you. <laughs> so Moses references this. God references this on the Ten Commandments, and Moses' 
speaks it. For in six days, why are we keeping this Sabbath holy? Because God started it. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and kept it holy. In this passage, God is he's not just requesting. He's not saying, oh yeah, by the way, it's a good idea. Which it is. He's saying, here's a command. Like, you're going to keep the Sabbath. Because in it, you are no longer allowing yourself to be defined by what held you in slavery. Your ability to produce. Or your inability to consume as slaves. You, you didn't have that anymore, right? What you can get done is not what defines you. It's who you are in the presence of God and his community. God commands them to keep the Sabbath, rest every single week and for a full day and worship him. And he even emphasized that he took a day off. I mean, did, did God need to rest? He's God. He's eternal. He's omnipotent, which means he has all strength and it never runs out. He doesn't even sleep. It's a big word called indefatigable. It means God doesn't sleep or slumber. Spell that for me if you can. But what's amazing is that God told people this concept thousands of years before phones and group texts and, and constant alarms and sports leagues and school. Like, doing too much has always been a thing. It's not new. People will always try to fit in as much activity as possible, and I promise you it's never been more true than today. All right? If you can have an opening in your schedule, you feel guilty for saying no to something that is an opening in your schedule. In fact, I would say that today's culture probably celebrates the exact opposite approach to this. Like we're encouraged to always be on, always be engaged, always achieve more. You feel that, I know you do. I wanna help us feel the weight of this a little bit. Okay. It's a line. Right. I'll get it right. <laughs> get it right? Like, it's kind of glorious just illuminating your brains now. Um, what are some things that you feel the pressure to do? I'm going to write them down a little bit. What are some things that you feel the pressure to do? Homework. Homework, okay. Ryan says don't do homework. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Alright, what's something else? Plan your future. Oh, man. Something else, shout it out. Sports. Sports. Uh, give me something you specifically want to do in sports, that you're encouraged to do in sports. Play better. Okay, play better in okay. sports. What else? Yeah. In all activities, you're expected to practice. Okay. <laughs> practice your activity. Sometimes you're just like, it is a celebration when I just show up today. That is a good, humongous step that I'm taking. It's, it's okay to just, that's a win, to wake up in the morning. <laughs> Amen. Uh, one more, one more. What's something that you're kind of expected to do or something Sleep. that, a thing to do what? Sleep. Uh, go, go to school. Go to school. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, I'd say. Go to college. Um, go to college. Do you guys feel the expectation for that? Yes. Let's, uh, let's make it more specific. In go to school, what's something, what's something that you're supposed to do? You're, you're, 
Get good grades, okay, I like that. That works with what I'm gonna do here. Get good. Get good. Okay, so here's why I wanna do this. Help me out here, here's the why. What is the payoff for doing your homework? Better job. I have no answer. Someone says not Learning, that kind of, what is the payoff for planning your future? Dala, dala, dala. Okay, getting a good job, getting money, getting paid. Yes. What is the payoff for playing better in sports? A 10% chance of getting a professional league of baseball. <laughs> That's incredibly specific. Uh, is that something we're wrestling with here? I'm just kidding. Um, okay, but um, more, more achievement, right? Winning uh, gold. Having more money. <laughs> Winning, let's just stick with that. Practicing your activity. What's the payoff for practicing your activity? Better worth that. Getting better. I heard that one, I like that one. What, what is the payoff for waking up in the morning? You're staying alive. What's the payoff for getting good grades? College. All right. Sure. People in the back are like, I'm being facetious with some of these. But you realize that there, everything that you're expected to do in your life, all the things that you're always feeling pressured to do, there's a payoff for them. And an easy one to describe. You should do your homework, because you'll get good grades, but more importantly, you'll learn, right? You, you should practice whatever your activity is so that you can show up and be better at it, have a better work ethic, whatever it is. And the thing with resting, when we, when we say, okay, here's a thing to do, I'm gonna put it on the to-do list, that's, the payoff is a hard thing to describe. Like, what, what? I just sacrificed an hour. I could, I could have been studying. I could have been practicing. I could have been planning my future. <laughs> I mean, it's just waste time taking it. Like, that's what it feels like. You know, like what's the payoff? What's the payoff? So if we don't study constantly, it's easy for us to say we're not gonna make a good grade. If we don't practice more, we're not gonna achieve excellence. Maybe it's, if, we're, if we don't go to the party with whoever, we're gonna, we're, gonna not gonna, we're gonna miss out, we're gonna be popular. If we don't do all the things all the time, we're not, and whatever the payoff is, we're missing out on it. When you get to resting, like what? Your culture is it's, it's, it's an easy thing to, to buy the lie. You have to be in constant motion, constant doing, constant availability. But God is telling us something here that is incredibly counterintuitive. That you were not made to be like that. The, the, the rhythm of life requires rest. It does. Let me give you an example. Great musical performance requires rest notes to let the music breathe. The way that we communicate requires rest notes. That's why we use periods and commas. Otherwise, sentences would just be crazy. You ever try talking to Siri without using periods and commas? Yeah. You're, you ever try talking to Siri using periods? You sound like a crazy person. Hey Siri, comma, text my wife that, quotation mark. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, you sound weird, but the reality is when you talk, comma, you naturally allow space for the hearer to process what you're saying. The rhythm of life requires rest. Your body was designed for rest. That's why every night it gets dark and your body goes, oh yeah, you're right, I should go to sleep. When you come to church, we want this time to be, when we come to the youth group, when we come to whatever, we want this time to be like that rest note. 
Come to be a place where you're taking an intentional pause to connect with the one who made you and loves you. And you, you know, this, this is the incredible truth. You can worship God with your rest. In your rest, through your rest, with your rest. You can worship God with your rest. I think that, 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 that God actually mandated that we intentionally rest, that we cease from the need to produce, to get more, to do more, so that it would enhance our relationship with him. Translation, I think, when you're constantly in motion, you're constantly doing, you're constantly going, and there's no break in your calendar, you naturally experience less of God. This should be a place where you can rest in your relationship with God. And in fact, I love the way that Jesus said that. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, Jesus said that very thing, right? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Where is that found? That's found when you come to me, Jesus says. Come to me and I will give you rest. When you choose to love God with all of your soul, you know what you do? You choose the rest of Him. You allow Jesus to carry the things that feel heavy. And the best place to do that is when you come in here. The people of God, the presence of God, the worship of God, the Word of God. In the body of Christ, you're experiencing the presence of Jesus. And you come to Jesus and you allow yourself to rest. I remember when I was in college, it's probably very true for you right now. I, I only say that because of, I, I didn't go to a youth group when I was younger. And so I remember when I was in college, it was the first like youth group thing I really ever went to. And I had a lot to do, okay? I had a lot to do. And at a certain point, I was working three jobs. I was engaged to be married. And I was doing an internship. On top of the fact that I had a million credits in school that I still had to finish. I remember every Thursday night, I would go, oh man, it's time to go to college group. I got so much to do. Oh my word. I like, no, I need, I need to do this. I'm going to create this rhythm. I'm going to choose to go to the presence of Jesus in the presence of other followers of Jesus. And I would come back so refreshed. I, I promise you, I would not have been able to make it through with the kind of relationship with God and the rest from Him had I not made that a rhythm of my life. You were designed to rest. Jesus says, come be with me, I'll carry. I will carry what's worrying you. I will carry what's stressing you out. I can handle it. You don't have to. I can rest. Quick question as we wrap up, what would it look like for your soul to find rest? Here's my challenge to you. Build rest into your rhythm. Make it intentional. It won't happen any other way. You know what I do? I have one day a week where I put it on my calendar and it says one word. And it goes from like 9 in the morning till 10 p.m. The word is nothing. And that's tomorrow for me. I was asked, actually, Jesus is alive. I was asked, to ref a soccer game tomorrow. And I said, sorry, I'm kind of booked all day. You know what I'm booked with? Nothing. Exactly, but it's on the calendar. <laughs> My calendar is full. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know what that also means? I don't get on my phone tomorrow. Oh, the amen's got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll respond on Tuesday. God can handle it. Here's the thing. I get, man, I, I get fried on Sunday. I was home for an hour today. But Sunday is not a Sabbath for me. I work all day. I'm working right now, right? Like, <laughs> I don't mean to, I love what I do. I really do. But here's what I'm saying. I need a day where I'm intentional and I say, I will not be defined by what I do. I must choose to 
see my definition through God's eyes. I am defined by whose I am. And I can only ever remember that when I push back on this culture and I say, I will plan to do nothing and just rest in Him. It's a day when I intentionally, I'll go to counseling on Mondays. I'll read a lot more scripture on Mondays. I'll wake up with worship music on Mondays. I'll take my family out and we'll go experience creation on Mondays. For me, it's Monday. It's probably a weird day for anybody else that has had it. But like, whatever it is, like, what is your rhythm? What is your rhythm? <laughs> for, whatever, for each one of you, the answer is going to vary. But here's one common denominator that I think should be true about who the people of God choose to take time off. Because we're not defined by what the world expects of us. What defines us is who we are. Take time off to be with the one that created you. Whether that's an hour every day, a whole day off, just stopping something, pausing something, whatever it is for you, I want to give you three suggestions that you can try this week. Okay, maybe you can talk about them in small groups if you want. Here's one suggestion. This is an insane idea. It might give you guys, like, goosebumps. Turn your phone off. I'm not lucky. I hate me. What do I mean? My phone isn't just a phone. My phone is a collection of thousands of lights that are projecting LED stimuli into my brain that my prefrontal cortex is constantly thinking about and how to make decisions about. It's giving me option after option after option after option. After, and, I, and I'm constantly going. It's not a bad thing, but it'll wear you down. Sometimes you think when I'm just chilling out, I'm going to relax, I'm just going to scroll through whatever feed I'm looking at. You think you're resting, your brain is definitely not resting. Your brain's constantly in motion when I go screen from me. It's the only effect, maybe for you, might just be out of the screen and zoom. No, okay, got my head, right? <laughs> but then, then there's, a, there's, turn your phone off, and all of a sudden, you're like, uh, uh, uh. Uh, gotta do something. Gotta, you know you don't. Don't be defined by what you do. Remember who you are. It's a small start, okay? And it's not a it's not a sin issue. It really doesn't have to be. But maybe just turn it off if you're at church. Maybe if if there's homework that you gotta do, get done, or if there's like free time and just rest time, and like I'm gonna choose. To, 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 to meditate. It's a biblical thing, right? I'm going to meditate. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Like, I'm going to choose to meditate on the presence of God, on the, on the beauty of God. And, and, and I can't do that when my brain is distracted. Meditation is intentionally setting my mind on something without distraction. I, I can't meditate if I'm constantly distracted. So I'm going to turn my phone off. And choose to let my soul rest. That's number one. Number two, maybe go somewhere where you can unplug. I was just at a retreat this last weekend. Guess what? No cell service. It was glorious. So glorious. I had to unplug. I had no choice. I get back into service and I've got like 10 missed calls and three voicemails. People who are upset about urgent things that when I get home, guess what? not actually a problem. Things are less urgent than you realize. It's amazing. Go somewhere where you can unplug and realize that you don't have to be everything everyone's calling you to be. You can rest. Maybe find a small way, number three, to be intentional in some time with God. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But maybe for you, it's just you spend some time reading the Bible. Every day, you've got a time every single day, and you're like, man, I'm going to choose to read the Bible at this time of day. Whatever it is for you. I remember when I was in high school, the Lord convicted me. I need to read my Bible every day. Man, I grew up in church. How I never heard that before. I, I had, but yeah, how many of you know like, there's a difference between what you hear from God's Word and what you actually put into practice, right? And so I remember, I was like, yeah, I actually should. And so I should, you know what, God, 
just to be safe, I'm going to read the Bible in the morning before I eat breakfast and at night before I go to sleep. That way, if I miss one, at least I got one of them in. I'm planning on books, right? And so I would do that. I would, I would just build this intentional thing into my day. Here's the thing. If you don't plan to do it, you probably won't because something else is probably going to take its place. What are you building into your day to be intentional about spending time with God? Maybe it's worship music. Maybe it's just a walk in nature. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe time in prayer. Maybe all of those. The way that the, the, the pace of your life works is it'll probably not happen if you don't plan it. Here's something I can guarantee you. You will never find the time to do it. Time gets filled up. You've got to make the time. Make, make the time for God. In fact, I think we agree in this moment that the most important thing that you can make time for is the one who made you. But somehow he kind of gets to be the last thing that gets pushed off the plate, right? What if we took everything off the plate and said, what should go on there first? And what should go on there next? And okay, they're not bad things, but maybe they just don't fit on a plate. And guess what? They're the things that don't matter. Maybe what if we built our lives that way? Sabbath rest allows you to do that. It allows you to reprioritize what your life is all about. It doesn't have to be a Saturday. It's when the Jews did it. We're not in the age of the covenant anymore. We're in the age of grace, of the Christ, of the church. That being said, this is still true as far as how you relate to God. You need to be off at times. Rest is a way that you can worship God. It's not meant to disrupt our rhythm, but enhance it because rest and restores us and it brings us closer to a connection with our Creator. So make an intentional choice this week to build rest into your rhythm. Let's pray. Jesus. Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of rest. That's a beautiful thing. I pray that you would be that in our lives. That you would be the Prince of Peace, the one that we find the source of peace and the source of rest from. As we come to you, Jesus, and bring our heavy burdens, I pray that you would give us rest as you promised you would. We know it's scary to choose to say no to certain things, but Jesus, I pray that you would, in your grace, give us abundance of rest in your presence. Amen.